the book of Isaiah, chapter 27. It's kind of interesting. One last prophecy of epic proportion in, is given in chapter 27 of Isaiah. Uh, take note tonight because tiny Israel, which has been surrounded by aggressive Arab nations for a long, long time, which has been beaten up by the United Nations, which has been boycotted by a lot of European nations, and ostracized from, uh, in Europe and beyond, and be, be, uh, take note of it. Be, take note of the fact that it has a future. Tiny little Israel has a future. Isaiah tells us that it is far greater, it's far superior, far stronger than any other nation that has ever ruled the world past, present, or future. I can bank on one thing. In the future, no matter how far you look, Israel's still there. And Iran might not be there. The United States might not be there. But Israel's still there. Chapter 27 is what will ultimately become of this tiny nation. Chapter 20, 27 is the finale. It's the crescendo of Israel. It's what happens to this nation. But before I get there, let me reemphasize this amazing modern-day miracle that Israel exists at all in our present world. Israel, I want to just give you a, a quick thumbnail view of it. That's, the, that's Israel. That little red dot is Israel. These are Arab nations that are around Israel. Most of them above 80 to 90 percent Muslim. Uh, those are the nations that are around Israel. That's tiny. The only democracy, the only democracy in that area. The only democracy. Now, if, to show you again, just to give you this is a little, little more expansive view, the Islamic nations go all the way down to Indonesia, they have, they have uh, parts in the Indian Ocean, down to Southern Africa, so it is massive and spreading to Europe, by the way. Uh, you have a lot of, a lot of uh, Islamics going to Europe, to London, we even, ha even have England there, so it's a spread. Islam wants to spread over the world. It wants, it's a civilization takeover. It's not a religion, it wants to take over civilization, either through a holy jihad, which is a war, or through subjugating of its subjects. So, well, that's what Israel is facing, and they're right in the middle of it, right in the midst. If you see it this way, uh, they say it's all about land, don't they say? The Palestinians want their land back. How much land do you need? I mean, there's the land. What do you need? That's, that's ridiculous. That's, so they're talking about land. It's not about land. The area in yellow is the entire country of Israel. The rest are all Muslim countries. You want, Iran, you want land? Most of Saudi Arabia is uninhabited. Go to Saudi Arabia. Take up off the Gaza Strip and go down a couple of miles and ask Saudi Arabia if you can live there. I'm sure you can because Saudi Arabia has one of the richest economies in the world. And so they should be able to help you. And so it's not about land. This is something that's very spiritual. Uh, we know this. They're surrounded by 22 Islamic nations, 640 times land size, 60 times its population of Israel. So if I were to put Israel on a chart and show you how, how, um, how they're threatened, it would look something like this. That's what's happening with Israel. And literally, armies are surrounding Israel. Now, let me show you this, and hopefully I can explain this to you. This is the, uh, a military comparison from the Muslim countries and, and Israel. So defense budget. For the Muslim countries, it's $174 uh, million. Israel, $15 million. And population, which is amazing, to be honest with you. Population, $1.6 billion, 1 billion. $5 million. Um, we see that of the organizations, this is for the, uh, the um, soldiers, 8 million. Israel, 160,000. So this is something that is absolutely a tremendous miracle. The Muslim nations that are surrounding them is Babylon, it's Iraq. Assyria, Philistines, that's Isaiah 14. So that's Iraq that we know today. Moab, these are all the old names. That's Jordan. Damascus, which is Syria. Cush is Sudan. Egypt is Egypt. Babylon, Iraq again. Duma, Arabia. Tyre and Sidon, that's Lebanon. Hezbollah is in Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon have always been pagan nations. It's Lebanon. Uh, Israel's neighbors, Jordan, Gaza, and Lebanon is Ezekiel 25. Tyre, Lebanon, Ezekiel 26 talks about it. Egypt, Ezekiel 20, 29. Look back up here in Egypt again, Isaiah 19. In Sudan, Isaiah 18. We've studied it. Damascus, Isaiah 17. Moab, Isaiah 15. You go down to Arabia, Ezekiel 30. Magog, Rosh, that's Russia. Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Tagarmar, Turkey, Persia, Iran, Kush, Sudan, Put, Libya, uh, Turkey, Syria, Northern Africa, Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Arabs of the West Bank and Gaza. That's Psalm 83. So all scripture tells you about these nations and a lot of those nations are still in play against Israel. So I want to give you a little bit more statistics. So I want to give you the world population. Our world population sits over 7 billion right now. It's heading quickly to 8 billion people. Uh, when you break it down, here's where most people live. The bulk of people uh, live in China or India. That's the bulk of people on the planet. So when we have an American understanding of the world, we're really a small part of the world, only 4.3%. And so India 
and China. Places like that you wouldn't think had a large population, like Nigeria, are only half the size of America. So that's, it's a small nation, but it's there. Russia is only 1.9%. Lots of land volume, not a lot of people. So I did something. I did something to let you know about Israel so you can understand. Israel's not on that map. You're not going to find Israel on that map. You'll find something that I wrote. I put something on that map for Israel. If I were to put Israel there, I want you to tell you about Israel. Israel has, uh, has 5 million Jews. Worldwide, it's 8.7 million Jews total. That is, and I put this down here if you can see it, it would be, if I stuck it in there, it would be a line half, this, half the width of that line. It's 0.11% of the world population, which means it's, it's just barely over one-tenth of 1% 1 of the world's population. Israel is, a, is an anomaly. Israel has to be something spiritual going on with it. Let me tell you why. Because that's like putting Vermont in there. That's like saying, it, and, and Israel makes headlines in the world 350 out of 365 days of the year. Uh, there's, it's, it's almost unbelievable. So even somebody who is a, who is a non-believer in Christianity or in Judaism or in God himself would have to say there's something going on in Israel, obviously, especially to still be alive amidst all those all the threats that are there. It's almost, there's almost a constant threat. Can you imagine living in a constant barrage of threats uh, and just being so tiny? So, uh, and in all proje projections, by the way, of our world, by the year 2065, which how many of you know we're not going to make? How many know we're not going to make 2065? It ain't going to happen. We are not going to make, we're not going to be on this planet in 2065. Let me show you this. These are the projections. So we see that, that Ch India is going to jump. They're going to get one point, almost 1 1.7 billion people, 1.7 billion people. And then China, uh, 1.2 billion people. It's called the, uh, it's called the window, the 1040 window. If you took a 1040 is the longitude and latitude. If you took that little strip out, that's where most of the world lives. And so, uh, you can go all the way down the line and you can see it. I think they have the United States is 410 million, right? now we have about 310 million so we're going to grow so the world's going to grow uh, we know that uh, that uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, publications that come out including national geographic says that the world's the world's resources cannot sustain cannot sustain us past 2050 can sustain us and so uh, we are vastly vastly running out of resources on planet earth so israel's not even mentioned in there because it's it's doesn't have that many people. It's never going to have that many people. It just has the most important personage that you could ever have. How many know who that is? God himself. And so that's why it's protected. So I want you to understand about Israel. Uh, and I know you know some of this, but I just want you to see it. So Isaiah tells us that not only will little tiny n Israel, this nation, go on as a nation, one day, are you ready for this? It's not only going to thrive, but it's going to be the nation, now get this, that rules the entire planet. I just, to me, it's just either that's preposterous or that's God. It's going to rule the entire, for a thousand years. Hey, the longest reigning empire was the Roman Empire. It lasted 650 years. This is going to almost double the, the rule of the Roman Empire. This is tiny little Israel. So I get excited when I think about Israel. So what I call the greatest epic or narrative or story of the end times is chapter 27 of Isaiah, because he's going to tell you how it happens. So I gave you a little outline for it, and here's the way it works. God will slay evil. This is how Israel is going to rise to ascendancy and rule the nations. Obviously, Christ is going to come back and rule through her, but this is what's going to happen. Uh, God will slay evil. That's chapter 27, verse 1. God will restore Israel. We'll talk about that. God will prosper Israel. God will save Israel, in the full sense of the word, and God will preserve Israel, and God will fulfill Israel. So let me start with this. How is it going to happen that Israel is going to rule the world? Let me show you what Isaiah says. And remember, Isaiah is living in 740 BC. This is almost 2,800 years ago that he's predicting this. If, he, if, you had read, if I had read this to you pre-1948, you would say I was nuts because Israel wasn't a nation for almost 2,000 years up until 1948. There was no Israel. Matter of fact, when the Balfour Declaration came out from England, who owned that area at that time, uh, they, the proposal was to put Argentina as, the, as Israel. They were to call a place in Argentina Israel. There were all different places around the planet to give the Jews. None of them, the last one, was the actual homeland of the Jews. So it's absolutely a miracle that you're living in. Your lifetime is living in a, an, an amazing prophetic miracle of Israel. So the first part, God will slay evil. In that day, and I put it in the Living Bible so you could follow along and be more, uh, more fluid for you. In that day, the Lord will take his terrible swift sword 
and punish Leviathan. We're going to talk about Leviathan. The swiftly moving serpent, the coiling writhing serpent, the dragon of the sea. Now I could probably spend all night on that. Let me tell you why. Because I've researched, I've researched everything about that and I found some amazing parallels. You know, the Bible, I tell people all the time, is shallow enough for a baby to walk in, but it's deep enough, deep enough to drown a man. There is so much here that I have never heard and I, and I think the, the whole, I know the Holy Spirit allowed me to put together that I want to share with you tonight because it's talking about God putting down evil and it's a symbol of this Leviathan and it further explains it, the swiftly moving serpent, the coiling writhing serpent, the dragon of the sea. Forget the fact that sea always represents in scripture, even though there's a literal sea, it always represents the sea of people. It always represents the influence over people. But, but beyond that, let me tell you exactly what this is saying. It's hard to imagine that evil is going to be done away with on the planet, is it not? That's hard to imagine. I mean, I mean, can you imagine if there was no evil? We would have in the news and I'd say, okay, that's in the news. And you'd say, well, what was in the news? And I'd say, exactly, there's no news. It's only good news. But evil would be done away with on the planet. Look how Isaiah depicts it and how he depicts evil. Leviathan, swift serpent, coiling writhing serpent, uh, and the dragon of the sea. Obviously, it's a dual meaning, that sea, because the dragons were believed to be in the sea, but also the sea of people. So let me give you a couple depictions of what people have imagined this serpent or this dragon would look like. And by the way, the ancients actually believed there were dragons in the sea. I'm not so sure that there wasn't some type of being that lived that looked similar to something like this. I'm not so sure about it. There's too many mythologies and too many stories that run around it. Uh, the dragon of the sea. So, let me tell you about it. A popular depiction is from the Middle Ages of St. George slaying the dragon. If you were brought up Christian as I was, you would know the story of St. George. St. George would slay the dragon. He's rescuing a maiden, which I'll tell you about in a, in a bit, and you'll see him depict it that way. So that's a popular image in the Middle Age, about 1100. Uh, I show people in Bethlehem the uh, amazing sculpture in the church that's there, but there, it's all over uh, Christianity, or at least Catholicism, uh, St. George slaying the dragon. But when I take people to Bethlehem, and we go to the church in the Nativity, where Christ was actually born, the actual spot, we're coming out, and we're exiting the church, and we're getting ready to go back out into the plaza, in Bethlehem's plaza, the Square. And right before we get out there, to the left-hand side, how many remember this? To the left-hand side, there's a picture. This is, it's actually a sculpture behind glass of St. George slaying the dragon. And I show it to them. I, and of course, when I show it to them, I can only briefly show it to them, but I know the story behind it. It's representative of this, of this man that has actually lived, St. George actually lived, and he was slaying evil. Now, it's a myth because St. George was really someone who kind of was going in his city and taking, taking down all the corruption that was in his city, including prostitution, and, and saving a maiden. So there's an actual story to it, but it became a myth. He is now taking down the dragon. St. George's Day, by the way, is celebrated in England on April 23rd, which is reported to be the day of his uh, martyrdom in 303 AD. So he's a patron saint of England, of Portugal, and many other countries. But Isaiah isn't, isn't talking about and writing about some myth here. It's not the multi-headed dragon of, of, uh, of, of the artists and the ancients feared as the cause of chaos in the world. He's writing about evil. He's putting evil into to a serpent form, and which obviously is a pretty good form to put him into because that's where we first see him in the Garden of Eden. Uh, so, but consistent in that image, it, Isaiah gives us three distinctive characteristics of this evil influence uh, on the world. And he does it so by talking about three different types of, of serpents, or three different types of movements of the serpents. And I studied and found it on my own through the Lord, I think, that it's pretty amazing. Now remember, I'm going to tell you how. Isaiah's writing in 740 BC. There are evil nations around him. Those nations have waterways. Every one of them have a certain waterway in them. Uh, so when he's talking about Leviathan, we place him in the sea, we place him in water. And man, it just started to pop out at me. Let me tell it to you. Number one, the swift moving serpent of the elusive one, or the elusive one, is Isaiah, in Isaiah's day represented Assyria. It quickly conquered the, the world, a nation located on the swift flowing Tigris River, one of the fastest rivers on the planet. So the swift flowing, the first thing he said is swift serpent, could have been Assyria on the Tigris River for his local prophecy. Now there's a deeper prophecy. How many are following this so far? So he's prophesying. So uh, to parallel this uh, Satan himself for all time, by the way, we know that, it's a nation located on the swift flowing Tiger River. Uh, so it would also parallels the Satan himself of all time. Obviously he's swift flowing. Obviously he's flowing through time and man. All you need to do is see what scripture calls Satan. Now I'm giving you level on levels. Anybody know what scripture, one of the names for Satan in scripture? 
The dragon, right? And what? The Assyrian. He's called the Assyrian. One of his names is the Assyrian. You can read about it in Ezekiel. And so you can see the parallel. Look at the levels that are here. Look at the levels of Scripture. And so Assyria, the swift, swift flowing Tigris River, the Satan himself is called the Assyrian. You can see the dual prophecy, not only of his time, but also right now, that Satan is flowing. How many believe Satan's flowing today? Man, he is flowing swift. How many of you have ever thought the world would get this evil? It is unbelievable. And so he's invading. He's going on. So there's a huge prophecy here. It's almost like uh, mankind's history in miniature in one chapter. Uh, so the, he's called this here. Next he says, the coiling, writhing, or twisting serpent. Well, I know, I know a little bit about Babylon. I know that Babylon was, was built on the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River does, is probably one of the crookedest rivers on the planet. It coils through Babylon. Fourteen gates were in the ancient Babylon to, uh, that, that you had a, and fourteen bridges that you had to go over the Euph Euphrates River. It wound through it. And so he's depicting not only, not only a Syrian empire uh, with the Tigris River, but he's also as evil, but also the Babylonian empire, which, by the way, took over Assyria. They conquered them and then eventually conquered Israel. So he's prophesying immediately, but there's something else that's going on here. He's talking about Babylon, the city on the winding Euphrates River. Another image of Satan himself, by the way. He is called the evil king of Babylon. When we read Revelation and we talk about Babylon, it's an evil city. We're not talking about the actual city in, in the Middle East. It's talking about the evil conglomeration of government and religion and everything that the Antichrist has. Uh, it also says, when we're, when we're looking at this, it talks about um, the third part. It says, lastly, in verse 1, he calls him the dragon of the sea, or the rushing one in one translation. It identifies Egypt with its dependency on the rushing Nile River. And so it rushes down from, from Lake Titicaca, way back down in, in the southern part, flows north and rushes to the delta. And by the way, if you want some of my sheets, they're from there, the Giza Plaza. They're the best sheets you'll ever own. You will never... No. Mike Lindell. That's where it is, by the way, the Giza. Best cotton in the world. So anyway, that's, it rushes. So how many have ever felt the rush of the enemy? How many of you ever felt, man, man, there's sometimes he just comes on so strong. So there's parallels all down the line here. This is not just one, one little, listen, if you read Isaiah, and this is, not, this is not to take away from you, trust me, and not to take away from your intelligence, but if you read chapter 20, 27 in Isaiah and you're reading through your Bible, you're never going to get that. You're just not going to do it. Unless you do what I do and spend, your, spend eight hours studying the Word when I, when I do a study, sometimes three hours on just one spot. Because you're diving, you're, you're, de you're delving into it, and God's opening things up to you. That's one of the great things about studying that word. And this is what it is. So, uh, come on, just these three verses. I could preach ten messages on this. Just these three rivers depict the evil one. But so do the three names depict the evil and Satan himself. Tigris, the Assyrians, the destroyer. He's called the Assyrian. We, we see the Euphrates of Babylon, the last evil world power, Babylon, the system. We see the Nile of Egypt, always depicted as sin in Scripture. Listen, in Scripture, you'll read about Egypt lots of times, and not necessarily the physical location. You will always go up to Jerusalem, but you always go down to Egypt. Down is indicative of sin. Or, excuse me, Egypt is indicative of sin. And each of these three countries, Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt had struck Israel and Jerusalem. God was against them. They were evil. Uh, this ultimate, their ultimate defeat was absolutely necessary for the Prince of Israel, uh, the, uh, the Leviathan in, in to, to come. The Leviathan in Isaiah's day and in times past had to be defeated. He had to be put down. Isaiah's talking about it. Uh, about who will, and who will finally take him down? Well, it's not a coincidence then that Jesus Christ was born after the defeat of these three world empires. And in the small gap of time in Roman history, when the doors of the Temple of Zeus were closed, and again, let me give you some mythology as we deep dive deeper. When those of you go to, those of you that are here, how many are going to Greece with us that are here? 55 people are going. You'll be in Greece, you'll see the, you'll see the Parthenon, and then I will show you the Temple of Zeus. It's still there. This is a temple in Roman times. When, when uh, Jesus was born, this, t this temple was ornate. It had two massive uh, brass doors on it. What the Romans did, Zeus was the god of all gods. And what the Romans did, because they had defeated Greeks, they had defeated the entire world, they had what was called a Pax Romana, a piece of Rome. And what they did, these doors were always open showing that Zeus was ruler of the world. The first thing the Romans did is they shut those doors to show that there was a peace in the world, no more war. 
All of their, all of their legions were pulled out. Now, when Christ was born, there was not one warfare going on in the known world at that time because Rome had settled it. Galatians 6.4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin. He had to come at that time. That's why Jesus was born there because there was a peace that ruled the planet, uh, albeit it came from the Romans. And so Satan himself knew that. He knew that that was going on. That was a time when no legions of Rome was at anywhere in the world at war in the uh, fullness of time as preparation for the coming of Christ who would ultimately slay the dragon of evil, Satan himself, and ultimately win the battle. So we know if it can show any chart, it would be that one. In that day, the Lord will take his terrible swift sword and punish Leviathan. That's what Isaiah says. Uh, the, the swiftly moving serpent, the coiling writhing serpent, he will kill the dragon of the sea. That is such a prophetic verse of something to happen, uh, something that's going to come, the conqueror Christ that's going to come. So Isaiah has an insight like no other. I've been reading Isaiah and I've read the prophets over and over again. I, have, I am totally blown away by what God has shown Isaiah and what Isaiah is writing, because he sees the full picture. He'll talk about the birth of Christ, and now he's talking about the millennial reign of Christ and talking about Israel. So you want to read a book. This, I'm so glad we're studying this book, because it is eye-opening, uh, and it's thrilling to me. Let me give you the second point. God will restore Israel. Uh, it says, in that day Israel's freedom, let this anthem be their song. In the, that day, of, and by the way, every time you say in that day, it always refers to the end times. In that day of Israel's freedom, let this anthem be their song. Israel is my vineyard. I, the Lord, will lead the fruitful vines, uh, ten, excuse me, ten the fruitful vines. Every day I'll water them, and day and night I'll watch to keep all enemies away. God never says that about the United States. He never says that about Russia. He never says that about any other single nation. It says this, and I will keep, watch to keep all enemies away. My anger against Israel is gone. That means he did have anger at one time. If I find thorns and briars bothering her, I'll burn them up, unless these enemies of mine surrender and beg for peace and my protection. Man, powerful. So what he's doing here? Here God speaks uh, of Israel, his people, as the vineyard and the fruit of his vine. If you've ever been to a vineyard when it's riping, when it's ripe, it's an amazing sight. It, they don't just ripen by themselves. They take a whole lot of care to be able to, to uh, have a harvest. In chapter 5 of Isaiah, he tells you about, and us about Israel as a vineyard full of thorns. They're rebellious. And he talks about, about them being full of thorns and being destroyed and briars. And as he uh, punishes Israel for their sins, chapter 5, verse 6 says this, I will lay it waste, this is Israel, I will, shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. What God does with Israel when they go whoring after other gods, that's the term is used, uh, he takes his hands off them. And if you understand somebody who's dressing a vineyard, and Jesus used the same parable, he's staying in the house. He's saying, I don't care if the rain comes, I don't care if thorns come up. He's not causing the thorns to come up, He's allowing them to come up. He's not pruning it. How many are seeing this? Man, it's, a, it's an amazing picture. He says, you want to rebel against me? I'll take my hands off that enemy that's so swift. I'll let him come and, and just destroy you. I'll let him come and, and ravage you. Not destroy, but ravage you. I'll let him bring you down to the root. Boy, that's New Testament right there. I'll let him do anything he wants to do because you have forsaken me. And so, but in Isaiah... There are no thorns or, or thistles anymore. There are no briars. Uh, he is, there's something else that's going on there. Uh, the, we see that what's happening in verse chapter 5, verse 6, he says, I'm going to destroy you because of, their, because of that. But here in chapter 27, there's no thorns or briars, just fruitful vines, protected, nurtured, and tended by the Lord himself. No human need is greater than to know that God protects us from harm. And he nurtures us to grow with, to grow with, the, with care of a loving father. You know, many people who come to the Lord from sinful past feel like they will, they will, they will forever be second-class citizens in Christianity. You know, women who have had abortions, I've counseled many of them, that then they come to Christ, feel that guilt, and they bring it with them. Or men uh, bring in fear of sexually transmitted diseases after they have years of promiscuity and finally come to Christ. Or gang members who, who try and hide the awful sins of their past. I know that because I understand what I came from. And so many times when I was in church and I would see somebody and my, my youthful Christianity, I felt like a second-class citizen that, that I couldn't be accepted. I know that. We all want that acceptance. We all want that growth. While consequences for our past sins can sometimes uh, sometimes haunt us or even stay with us. The parable of the vineyard is a promise to all of us that God has not and, and God and not, has not and never will give up on us. He will never give up on Israel. And if you commit yourself to him, he'll never give up on you. That's his promise. The beauty of the gospel is that once we commit to Christ, 
he commits fully to us and fully to care for us. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter, cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. This is the vineyard, the dresser of the vineyard. God's care for me goes beyond what I can see or imagine. God has more care for you than you could possibly imagine. He has more care for me than he, I could possibly imagine. He will allow me to grow as much as I want to grow under him. If, if I'm not rebellious and, and go against him, I'm going to grow like a weed. I'm going to grow in my, in my attitude. I'm going to grow in my love. I'm going to grow in every good characteristic that God has for me. As long as I stay, as long as I stay under his care. When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and you trust the engineer, Corey Ten Boom says. So sometimes your, your, your life gets dark. Sometimes you think, wow, where is God? Where is this care for me? Well, just because, it sounds like, just because it seems like it's dark around you, you don't throw away the ticket. You don't get off the train. You trust him because you're going to come through the other side. How many of you know that going through things is part of life? And especially when God's there because he's going to bring you through it. Uh, every vineyard doesn't have, doesn't have the perfect amount of sunshine and rain every, every season. Uh, but God tends to it when those things happen. Third, isn't this amazing? It's amazing. God will prosper Israel. The time will come when Israel will take root. Oh, I love this because Isaiah is pulling the entire Bible down into this chapter. Will take root and bud and blossom and fill the whole earth with her fruit. He says the time's coming when Israel's going to start to bud and blossom and the entire earth is going to be filled with the goodness of Israel. Here Isaiah is bringing yet another image to light about Israel, namely the root of Jesse. He already told us about it in Isaiah 11.1. 1. We already studied it. There shall come forth a rod out of, st uh, of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. So yes, it's about Jesus, but it's also about Israel as a nation. It's another dual prophecy. There's so many layers to what God is telling us. So what began as a holy seed in a stump, Isaiah told us, in chapter 6, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. He's talking about the nations, talking about a holy seed that's there. He's given the analogy of this, of this root, and this seed, and this growing, and the branches, and the budding. He's telling us something of the future of Israel. Uh, it's going to happen. Again, a dual prophecy. The branch we know is Christ. Isaiah now sees the branch blossoming. He sees a budding and producing fruit that will one day fill the entire world, the entire nation, or the entire planet. What a promise for a, for a smidgen of a space on a face of the earth called Israel. What a promise for a rural, agricultural people in the midst of, a, of an urban world, a cultural, uh, a cultural uh, super, uh, sophistication of commercial wealth and military strength. What a promise for little Israel. What a promise for a people headed towards years of exile, almost total annihilation, and a horrific holocaust. Only God could see such a vision and make such a promise. When Isaiah says in verse 6 that Israel will, be, will blossom in bud, He's pre-shadowing what Jesus said would happen towards the last days in your lifetime. Because the Bible says this, now learn the parable of the fig tree. Fig tree, vineyard, all symbols of Israel. Uh, when his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. He says this generation will not pass away, verse 33, until all these signs be fulfilled. You and I have seen Israel bud and blossom on May 14th, 1948. You, some of you were living. You may have been small, but you were living. I wasn't, but you may have been small, but you were there. You were on the planet when Israel budded. So you are literally living. Our generation is literally living through what Isaiah was talking about, a promise that's there. And he said it 2,800 years ago. Listen, verse 6 is talking about Israel prospering as a nation. We have a whole different understanding of prosperity in America. We wouldn't know prosperity if it hit us in the head. We just would not know prosperity. We have no knowledge of what prosperity is. We think it has to do with economic stability, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Prosperity, uh, prosperity as Isaiah aptly points out, is not about gathering in. It's not about building up. It's not about taking stuff in and so you're, you're wealthy or you have a big bank account or a large portfolio. It has nothing to do with that. But rather, it's concentrated on budding, producing, and giving out. That's what prosperity, real prosperity is. If, these, if the vineyard only took sun and sunshine and, and, uh, and, and rain in and you never can go and pick a fruit, what good is the vineyard? 
Uh, I give this analogy when I take people to Israel. There is one body of there's one uh, body of water that flows through. It's called the Jordan River. It starts high up in the mountains of of of, um, of uh, Lebanon. It starts in Mount Hor Mount Hermon actually. And as the water as the snows melt and the waters come down, it feeds into the it feeds seven springs that go into the Sea of Galilee. The sea of Galilee is loaded with fish. You can go in there. We throw nets and sometimes we catch something, sometimes we don't. You can fish off the bank. There's I think seven different types of sardines. There's Peter fish. There's all kinds of fish in the Sea of Galilee. You'll see people fishing on the bank. Then that river exits the Sea of Galilee in the southern end and it flows all the way down through the border between, between Jordan and Israel and it ends up in the Dead Sea. You can, take, you can take everything you have that you possibly own to dredge the Dead Sea and you will never find one single thing that's living. It's called dead because it's dead. There's nothing living there. What's the difference? It's the same water. Well, because one takes in and gives out and all the other one does is take in and never gives out. The Dead Sea's drying because it never gives out. It's an al analogy for all of us. You can take the great sin of God, the forgiveness sin of God, if you never give it out, you're going to die on it. And God says he'll actually take it away from you. And this is what the prosperity, prosperity has nothing about get, taking in, it's about giving out. It's, a per, it's not about personal accumulation, it's about personal divestment. It's about blessing others with your time and your resources. <laughs> here's, what monet, here's what monetary no trouble prosperity does to a Christian. I'll give you a quote. Prosperity too often has the same effect on a Christian that a calm at sea has on a Dutch mariner who frequently, it is said, in those circumstances, ties up the rudder, gets drunk, and goes to sleep. That's what prosperity does for us, the material prosperity. Uh, let me give you a couple other quotes. Some of them you may know the people in. I would rather have the crumbs off the master's table than all the riches promised by the false prosperity gospel. So I went to the internet and I put in people who have quotes about prosperity. And I came up with some people you know. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. I'll, I'll take those because we know these people. Right from the internet. I was surprised, by the way, but I'm going to tell it to you. This one you know. David Platt said this. We are, setting for, we are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. Then I found this guy who was quoted on the internet. The reason we are given faith is not to make us healthier and wealthier, but rather to confirm to us that in Jesus, God has given us everything we need. That's prosperity. That's what it's about. Next, Isaiah brings us quickly to this. God will save Israel. And I'm going to tell you something. We pray for Israel. We want to bless Israel. But don't think Israel's saved. Israel's 88% secular. It is worse than the liberals in America. And I want you to know that. That is not why we pray for Israel. We pray for this that's coming for Israel. We pray for God's hand to turn Israel. Has God punished Israel as much as he has punished the, his, her enemies? No. For he has de devastated her enemies while he has punished Israel but a little, exiling her far from her own land as though blown away in a storm from the east. And why did God do it? It was to purge away her sins, to rid her of all the idol, idol altars and her idols. They will never be worshipped again. Boy, that is an amazing statement when you think about it. Isaiah asked the hard question that Israel was thinking. Has God punished us? They were going through a punishment when he was talking about it. They were ready to be exiled. They were being taken away by, by Assyria and Babylon. They were being swept away. He says, why is God punishing us like he's punishing our enemies? What, you know, what's he doing here? Why is, he, why is this coming on me? And they're, they're asking the hard question. Isaiah asks, asks it and he answers it. Has God punished us like his enemies? That are his enemies the heathens that are against him? The answer comes pretty swift. Absolutely not. It's like the difference, I think, between divorce and death. Big difference. God's wrath placed on his enemies is a sure death. If you're an enemy of God, you're not going to survive. That's the plain truth of it. But God's wrath on wayward Israel is to put her away for a while, to divorce her for a while, while, while she comes to her senses. That's what it is. I'm going to turn my back on you a while. Look, Jehovah is married to Israel. Jesus is married to Israel. We're the bride of Christ. Jehovah is the, is the, is the, uh, is the groom of Israel. Jehovah has made promises to Israel. Israel has backslidden. They've gone away from him. And basically, he still has his promises that he has to fulfill. You see, Jehovah has a covenant relationship with Israel. He consumed Assyria. He consumed Babylon. He consumed Egypt. And he will, he will consume the reign of Antichrist to come. But God purges Israel in their sins. Matter of fact, he actually purges us. Whom the Lord loves, he chastises. He puts you away for a little bit. He makes you feel the pain so that you can come back to him. I remember this one guy used to come to our church in cathedral and uh, his wife was there religiously. She was a great, great woman of God. She would always pray for her husband. He'd always backslide to do something. And I remember he'd come and he'd come to the altar when he came in and he would 
cry and he would repent and it's because something happened in his life and he'd be back at the altar and he'd cry and repent and he'd be great he'd do well and it was sincere it wasn't something he was just doing it was sincere and then a couple months later I'd see him slip out of church again she'd be praying the same prayers for him again and, and then a couple months something terrible would happen in his life and he'd come back to I've saw, I saw it by maybe three or four times he'd come back pastor please come and pray for me I need salvation and pray for me and of course we would because God forgives so I remember the one time he came back his wife was so excited because he had been doing some other stuff and the, the, the fourth, fourth or fifth time and he came to the altar crying he said pastor pray for me I said no I'm not praying for you he says I want to get, dedicate my life to Christ any other pastor would say, well, yeah, let, you know, let's do that. I said, no. He said, why won't you pray for me? I said, I'm afraid to pray for you. He said, why? I said, because every time I pray for you and you go away from God, something bad happens to you. I said, you're gonna, I'm going to pray for you and God's going to forgive you, which he will. He'll forgive you whether I pray for you or not. He's going to forgive you. Then you're going to go out and forget him and you're gonna, something bad. Maybe the next thing that's bad that's going to happen to you is going to take your life while you're, while you're away from him without getting into theology. And he looked at me and said, I said, do you realize the only time you come to God is when you're desperate? And I said, now God will take you, but do you realize it? Do you understand that you're putting yourself in harm's way every time you repeat that pattern? And he said to me, what do I have to do? I said, you have to make some vows. You gotta make some vows in front of me and your wife that you are going to stay with God and that as soon as you start to stray, you're gonna call me, you're gonna to confess to her, you're gonna make yourself accountable. Because all you're doing is you're running a rail and that rail, will, God will take you in, trust me, but I, you, are, you are playing Russian roulette with your Christianity. And basically, that barrel can fire you at any time when you're away from him. It's about God purging us. It's about God, what, what God was doing, obviously, when he got away from him, because he loved him, was making, allowing things to happen. And those things, some of them were self-induced, some of them weren't. How many are getting this? And so, this is what he's doing with Israel. It's a big difference. God purges Israel of its sins and he places her in exile as judgment and they get, went through judgment. Remember what Jesus said when they were leading him out to crucify him, what he said to the women of Jerusalem? What did he say to them? Weep not for me. Come on. Nobody knows? No, he said, weep not for me, weep for your children. That's exactly what he said. Man, that is powerful. We skip over that. What he was saying was, I'm okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give my life to them, but what about your children? Are they going to invest in, in, in me? Are they going to invest in God? We for your children. They're the ones that are in danger. And he was pretty serious when he said it. I mean, in the midst of his, in the midst of his pain. So, his sole purpose, God, was to bring his people back to himself as their one and only God. So, let me show you what's happening in Israel. The chart got cut off, but I'll show it to you anyway. This is the, uh, how Jewish, uh, Israeli Jewish adults identify themselves. 42% of them are secular. They wouldn't know God if he sat next to them. 25% are not very religious. They wouldn't know God if he sat next to them. 13% are traditional, which means they go through the motions, but they really don't have a, any type of understanding of God. They'll go through Shabbat, and they'll go through things, but it has nothing to do with a lifestyle. 12% of them, 12 are religious, and they're zealous. They're, they're all down the line. For, and then you have 8% which are ultra-Orthodox. The religious are down the line, but again, that may not translate to the lifestyle. So honestly, only 8%, and even the ultra-Orthodox are kind of strange, but only 8% really have an understanding of who God is. Now, if I could tell you, Israel is 80% or greater secular. They're not following God. 80% of them. That should blow you away. That should blow all of us away. So what does God do? Why do you think there's so much struggle with Israel as a nation today? Why do you think everybody's at them with those arrows? What is God doing? God's not going to destroy Israel. They're never going to get destroyed. That's the one part. The flip side of that is they're going to have troubles till they come back to him. They're going to have a lot of trouble. How many are following this? It's a plan. It's a pattern. And, and we can see it in Scripture. So is trouble coming for Israel? Well, can you say seven-year tribulation? Because they're going to go through it. Can you say peace treaty under the Antichrist for three and a half years? Can you say him breaking the, the peace treaty and torturing the ones that are, that are there, that are the followers of, of Jesus Christ? Can you say abomination of desecration? Well, the answer is that God will, sur will save Israel, 144,000. Let me, before I get there. So why has God done it? Well, Israel today is secular. It's not a godly nation. The nation doesn't acknowledge God's hand in their reestablishment and in their successes. Israel's survival continues to be a struggle. There's no lasting peace for Israel. Will there ever be? Yes, there will. Look, 144,000. They appear in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. We see further details about these evangelists. 
They stand on Mount Zion and they preach Christ. They are pure virgins, never having sex. Well, the Jehovah Witnesses think they're the 144,000. I promise you there are not 97%, I promise you 97% of Jehovah Witnesses are not virgins. <laughs> I promise you that. You know, it's safe to say it's not the Jehovah Witnesses. These are Jews, male Jews, that start a revival in Israel. All Israel, Rome, uh, Paul says, will be saved. Listen to it. So, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So we know a national revival is coming to Israel. God's going to rule. Jesus is going to rule through that nation. Trust me, that nation is going to turn. It's going to take some wars. It's going to take some time. But that nation is going to turn. Paul sees it in Romans. Wow, Isaiah saw it way back in 740 B.C. Fifth. Still with me tonight? Yes? Okay. God will preserve Israel. Her wall, I'm almost done. God will preserve her. Her walled cities will be silent and empty, houses abandoned, streets grown up with grass, cows grazing through the city, munching on twigs and branches. It's talking about Israel, talking about Jerusalem. My people are like the dead branches of a tree, broken off and used to burn beneath the pots. They're a foolish nation, a witless, stupid people, because they were rebellious when he was writing, where they turn away from God. Therefore, he who made them will not have pity on them or show them his mercy. Yet, the time will come when the Lord will gather them together one by one. That is from all over the world, by the way. The Camel Company will gather them together one by one like hand-picked grain, selecting them here and there from his great threshing floor that reaches all the way from the Euphrates River to the Egyptian boundary. Can I tell you that right here is loaded with all kinds of prophecy. It's loaded with all kinds of truths. He's going to gather them together. Here Isaiah is telling that uh, of the uh, immediate destruction of the walled city of Jerusalem in his day by Babylon and the exile of God's people. Then before he finishes, he launches out over 2,800 years into the future, your future and mine. And he talks about God handpicking the Jews one by one from here and there. It's, it's all from all over the world is what the indication is. Establishing them in their land. And get this, his great threshing floor where he will separate the wheat from the tares. You know what the great threshing floor of, of Israel is? It's Mount Zion. It's Ornan's threshing floor. That's where the temple will sit. And that's where Solomon's temple sat. David brought it from Ornan. He bought it, it was a threshing floor high up in the mountain. That's where Solomon's temple would sit, the threshing floor. You want to see it over here? It's right there. That's where the Ark of the Covenant sat, right there on the bedrock, the threshing floor of Ornan. That's where Jerusalem built up to. That's where, where Jesus entered. He was in the temple area. And then he goes on to say that, that they're going to be from the, what did he say, the Euphrates? Listen to it. He said, from the Euphrates River to the Egyptian boundary. That's interesting to me, because that's the land that God promised Abraham. And here it is. That's the border God promised Israel is going to inhabit. So when I told you about tiny Israel, they are going to inhabit this land. 1967 day war, they won that. When the 1967 day war, that white part, they won that. But he says they're going to have, they're going to part, take part of Saudi Arabia. They're going to take all of Jordan. They're going to take all of Lebanon. They're going to take most of Syria. They're going to take half of Iraq. And how is that going to happen? I'm going to give you a suggestion. I think Iran, which uses proxies, by the way, Hezbollah in Lebanon, they use, they use uh, in Iraq, they use a lot of uh, militia that's against Israel. Uh, they use the Muslim Brotherhood here. I think when all of these conglomerate, which we see in, in, in a, a Psalm 83, and they go against Israel, by that war, Israel's going to end up in those borders. They're going to end up taking that land because it's God's promise. And it doesn't matter what it looks like right now. If God said it, it's going to happen. He promised it to Abraham. Isaiah saw it. That's going to be future news someday. And it's going to happen. So the Egyptian border, to, that's the map of today. And oh yes, Pastor Mark, we want to see exactly what that is. Well, I'm glad you asked me because that's why I showed it to you. It's the same land God promised Abraham. So here's my prediction. The coming wars mentioned in Scripture against Israel, Psalm, 86, Psalm 83, excuse me, and the Gog-Magog war in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 will be won by Israel. And they will take Lebanon, Hezbollah land, most of Syria, Babylon, that's the Bashar al-Assad's land, half of Iraq. And now, and this is what's happening. Iran will no doubt use their proxies and these nations as proxies against Israel, but Israel will, will be, as Isaiah puts it, preserved by God himself. Wow, it absolutely blows me away that we can go back into Scripture over 2,800 years and line up nations and lands, boundaries, as well as current news headlines to the Word of God. 
it amazes me that we can do that 2,800 years later. If you're watching this on YouTube or if you're watching it on Facebook and you're a non-believer or, or you're skeptical about the Word of God or if, or if you believe that it was just written by men, I heard that so many times, then show me any other book or writing that gives detail after detail of the time you live in and it lines straight up to your news of the day. Show me and then you'll make me a believer. And it's all over Scripture, this prophecy. And Isaiah hits on it. God will preserve Israel. God promises to gather them back one at, one at another. The phrase one by one refers to the complete, the complete scattering of the Jews throughout the world and the expansion of the Holy Land and God bringing them back. How did they get scattered? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the prophecy of the book first. Total verses in Scripture, 31,102. How many deal with prophecy? 8,352. Percent of the word that's prophecy, 26.5, 20, 85%. That's more than a quarter of your word is about prophecy. There's no other book that big or anywhere that you can read that has a quarter of prophecy. Total number of chapters in the Bible, 1,189. Total number of chapters devoted to prophecy, 150. Percent of chapters that are prophecy, 12.62%. One out of every 10 chapters you read in your scriptures about prophecy, something that hasn't happened that was been when it was written about. Israel, tiny little Israel is going to rule the world. Has God been gathering them together? You bet. He's been taking them in from 1878, 25,000 people lived in Israel. Today, you have 6.3 million people living in Israel, Jews. He's gathering them in. And he's gathering from the whole world. We know that there's Ashkenazi Jews. It means, means European Jews or Germanic Jews from up north. We know there's Sephardic Jews. That's from the northern part of Africa. We also know there's Mizrahi Jews, which is eastern, the Middle East. He's gathering from, and then there's independent groupings. We have Jews coming from, from um, Ethiopia. We have Jews coming from Russia. They're coming from everywhere. And the land, Isaiah said the land's going to expand. Here's how the land was in 1946. That white is Jewish land. 1947, that white is Jewish land because they were attacked. 1967, that white is Jewish land. T 2010, that is Jewish land. And now uh, President Trump has said the goal on is yours. And so we know that it's continuing to expand. We're watching a miracle happen in our lifetimes. We're watching God perform what he said way back to Isaiah. Lastly, God will fulfill Israel. In that day, again, last days, the great trumpet will be blown. Many about to perish among their enemies. Assyria and Egypt will be rescued and brought back to Jerusalem to worship the Lord in His holy mountain. Their enemies will be brought back with a grand finale of final great trumpet sounds. Isaiah closes his amazing chapter of end times on a note of world peace. Even from the enemies of Israel. Assyria, by the way, is Iran today, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. They will start to come back and worship the Lord. To this heart-stopping promise, Isaiah implies a caution. God will not lead the return of his people and the promise of the restoration of Jerusalem for ethnic reasons. He won't do it for political reasons. He won't do it for economic reasons. And he won't do it for social purposes. No, his his singular goal, Isaiah tells us, is so that they can worship the Lord in his holy mountain. Wow. God places, always places peace and prosperity and preservation of his people soundly on the condition of worship. The reason we don't have peace in the world today is we're not worshiping God. We worship God, you have peace in the world. World peace doesn't come by any government. It comes by worshiping God. Let me leave you with a couple things. Worship is the most powerful, joy-producing, hope-sustaining, life-altering thing a person can do. I, I don't like to get real personal with you, but uh, I'm going to. Cheryl and I have, uh, in, our, in our living room, we put this, these doors in that open way up into our, into our uh, outside. And so in the morning, our habit is this, if we have time, which sometimes is tough, our habit is this. We get up, we have our coffee, we sit in two swivel chairs that face in and can face out. We open those doors when it's nice. Sometimes I think it's nicer than Cheryl thinks, but we open those doors when it's nice and we have our coffee and we have two Sonos speakers that are there and we put on worship. Stuff that we knew when, we, when I first got saved. And I can't tell you how many times, I'm just be honest with you, I can't tell you how many times after we talked about our plans, we just sit there and, and I don't cry about a whole lot of things, but every now and then it'll hit me. And we just cry because we're worshiping God. People may think we're nuts. If our kids came in, they probably thought we lost our, our kids do come in at times. And they come in and they look at us and they walk right back out. But worship is something. It does something to you. It helps you. It does something. It, it rejuvenates you. Listen, the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and helpless. Worship, true worship that is pleasing to God, 
radiates throughout a person's entire life. It's not about just going to church on a Sunday and singing some songs. It's not even about me and Cheryl sitting in, in chairs and worshiping God. It's about your entire life. Your entire life has to be a life of worship. Worship is a huge part of our everyday life. And we are worshiping sometimes even when we don't know we're worshiping just by living the life. And the one quote that I found that I love the best is this. I'll leave you with this. Worship is simply giving God his breath back. He breathed breath into Adam and all you're doing is breathing it back to him. Can you close your eyes and bow your heads with me for a moment? Man, that is a Bible study and a half. Maybe a Bible study on steroids. I'm not really sure. A lot of stuff there. A lot of things for you to mull around, maybe to listen to again. People tell me all the time, Pastor Mark, I have to, I have to rewind and listen again. Good. Rewind as many times as you can. God's speaking to us. He's telling us. He's giving you truths. He's giving me truths in this, in this study. And we're listening. We're seeing world events that we can make sense of. You know how many people can make sense out of the world? We can. So tonight, I just want to, as we bow, just, just, let's just in your own way, without even raising your voices, just in your silent voice, just worship God for a moment. Would you do that as I pray for you? Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for those that are the committed that have come to this study, Lord God. And it's really about final peace, Lord God, and worshiping you. Our world is messed up, Lord. There is so much misinformation, so many things, so many people grabbing for straws, not knowing who to trust you, who believe. I know, Lord God, that as we search you out, you make things evident to us. I know that you will preserve us. You will save us, Lord God. I know that you will prosper us, Lord, in real prosperity. And I, Lord, Lord, I know, Lord God, you will put down our enemies. So tonight, Lord God, I thank you for the peace that settles upon us because of your word. Bless us now, Lord God. Every family that's here, Lord God, the ones that can't be with us, bless them, Lord. They're going in and they're coming out. They're sitting down and they're rising up, Lord God. Let them remember that they are the head and not the tail. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you.